à distance, euh, c'est un peu inhabituel mais je, je vous salue à Bruxelles et je suis au centre d'études européennes à l'université Harvard aux états unis à Boston et ben, on s'intéresse, il y a voilà, euh, j'allais dire toute une industrie académique aux états unis qui s'intéresse à l'Europe et qui est surtout préoccupée aujourd'hui euh, par la crise européenne. Alors je sais que vous avez toute une série de conférences dans votre programme pour en parler. Euh, moi, ce, ce dont je vais parler aujourd'hui, c'est surtout le euh, voisinage de l'Union européenne et euh, euh, j'espère qu'on aura peut-être le temps pour des questions à la fin. La conférence sera en anglais, donc je passe maintenant. I switch to English and uh, I think it may be easier for uh, some of the participants. I think the obvious uh, place to start is to say that the map of Europe, uh, both the uh, geopolitical but also the mental maps are now being redesigned, but this is not Uh, an entirely new thing. In fact, the tectonic plates uh, uh, from uh, 1989 are still moving. This, what we are witnessing. So basically, what what we're talking about, we we have a, um, a new map of Europe, a new relationship between the European Union, which is the core of the post. Cold War uh, European architecture um, uh, is now being uh, itself affected by uh, this transformation process. To put it in a nutshell, for, what, for 20 years or so, we have presumed that uh, the European Union is the core of that European architecture and that it is spreading Uh, eastwards, southward, that basically the center is the European Union and that it is spreading its influence uh, 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 in the different uh, directions. I hope I... Is this, is this okay? So, now we discover uh, uh, two things. First of all, that Europe has an internal crisis of the European Union, but at the same time, it is confronted with an external crisis uh, on its peripheries. So you have a simultaneous internal and external crisis, uh, both of our neighborhoods, east and south, east with the Ukraine and Russia moves in Crimea uh, last year, and south uh, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring and the whole destabilization of the southern Mediterranean flank of the European Union, both of our neighborhoods have basically uh, 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 gone into turmoil, being destabilized, and Uh, uh, not only that, uh, it confronts the European Union with the interaction, this is the novelty, between its internal crisis and its external uh, uh, crisis, its external challenges. So um, if one had to um, consider this from the point of view of the core EU policies, you would say the European Union internal crisis is known as essentially as a crisis of the Eurozone. This, this is what since 2008, uh, uh, since the international financial crisis has been the main, uh, 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 let's say, 
issue on the agenda, and also, one could add, the main dividing line among member states. Roughly, it, is, it, was, it brought into the open a north-south divide within the European Union. Now, the external crisis uh, that I have mentioned, East and South, has blown up the European neighborhood policy. You know, if, if neighborhood implodes, your neighborhood policy implodes with it. The neighborhood policy was conceived in different circumstances, which I will return to, and is now to be completely reinvented. So um, this, is, this is really what uh, is the subject of our uh, discussion today. Uh, uh, if you want indication or contradictory symptoms of what I'm talking about, just think of the European Parliament elections in May 2014, where basically uh, Eurosceptic or populist uh, uh, anti-European parties made major progress uh, 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 and challenged basically the uh, core of the European projects in various ways. And at the same time, on the same day, you had an election in Kiev where the uh, victors were running under the European banner. So I couldn't think of a more uh, striking contrast uh, than, than on the same day, the 25th of May 2014, a European election in Kiev, which basically, uh, 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 you know, claims to be the victory over pro-European forces, and at the same time, um, major Eurosceptic uh, 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 impact in the European elections uh, uh, to the Parliament uh, in Brussels, where, where you are. So somehow you have there the attraction of the European Union and outside, and I could have the same argument about some countries of the Balkans, and deep doubts about the European project inside. So this is just to complicate things further. We have the crisis, internal, external, and we have the uh, attraction of the European project uh, diminishing inside, but uh, remaining strong outside. Uh, in a way, even the migration crisis, the fact that hundreds of thousand people uh, uh, south of Mediterranean, when they are in dire straits, want to come to Europe as a place where they feel not only safety, but also possibly for them a future uh, prosperity. Uh, basically a place where they see their future, uh, that is an indirect homage to the European Union. So here we have it, you know, uh, EU destabilized internally and by the implosion of its peripheries, EU in doubt internally, but remaining attractive externally if you are in Kiev or in Belgrade, where do you see the future of your country or where do you hope your country may be heading, you still think the EU is uh, where you want to be, maybe not tomorrow, but, you know, in 10, 15 or 20 years. So this is, this is where we are. This is basically uh, the landscape in which, uh, uh, in which we are. What I suggest to do is look at the way the implosion in our neighborhoods has reformulated some of the key postulates. So uh, first, how the change in the neighborhood challenges the main postulates of the neighborhood policy. 
as it was designed uh, after 2003, then uh, uh, how to account for the situation, what are the main explanations, and finally, uh, what are the main issues that will be shaping uh, uh, EU's uh, relationship with its neighborhoods uh, in, in the near future. So uh, let, me, let me begin with the, uh, with the first point. I think that uh, most of the literature, I suppose some of you have been uh, uh, looking at the literature about the European Union and uh, uh, the way it has uh, uh, been described in many of the authors uh, 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 is the EU as a normative power. The EU basically as uh, a norm setter, a country, uh, uh, a political entity which uh, ha is not just uh, a market, a common market, uh, it is uh, uh, an institution and a body of legal norms, binding norms for its members. And the way it has operated is trying to uh, diffuse, disseminate uh, its influence, its norms, uh, in, uh, uh, through what has been known as soft power, in other words, not by imposing by force, uh, but by promoting, diffusing, disseminating its uh, uh, values and its norms uh, through uh, 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 what Joe Nye, actually professor at Harvard, has defined as soft power. In other words, uh, uh, indirect influence. You are getting influence either by using economic uh, leverage or uh, uh, various other tools at your uh, disposal. Uh, uh, Ian Manners even described the uh, European Union uh, uh, in, a, um, in an interesting way. He said uh, the EU, uh, uh, the, the, the shaping, you know, the shaping of the international role of the EU is not by what it does, but what it is. And uh, that sort of sums it up because we are a community of like-minded, democratic, peaceful countries, the peace project and the normative project go together. Uh, this is what makes us uh, attractive, and this is how we can spread our influence. And if you, uh, if you want an illustration of that uh, model, uh, let's say the enlargement of the European Union uh, to Eastern Europe uh, after, you know, in, 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 uh, uh, in the 90s and, and culminating, of course, with EU accession in 2004 and 2007 uh, of 10 member states. Well, that was the illustration. You have um, EU. So uh, that's, that's the first model. Uh, if uh, it has been called Europe's transformative power because the countries are attracted by the EU because they want to join um, they are prepared to accept uh, EU norms EU institutions EU uh, uh, market mechanisms so that's, uh, that's the main, main logic uh, Konrad Adenauer the former German Chancellor uh, described uh, way back uh, uh, in the 60s this attraction of the European model as magnet Europa. Europa, Europe as a magnet. It attracts, and because it is attractive, you are prepared to do a number of things to your own system, your economy, your society, your institutions, in order to be able to join it. So this is basically the logic of Europe's transformative power and one could argue, I know you will have lectures about that and therefore I will say no more about it, but it has been the main success of the European Union uh, uh, of the last 20 years. I don't think anybody today would claim that um, Europe, 
the European currency has been its main success. We may hope and pray every day that uh, it uh, 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 overcomes its crisis, that maybe finds a new institutional arrangements for that, but uh, you would hardly describe it as Europe's main success. No, the main success story was and remains the enlargement to the East, the fact that democratic stability has been extended peacefully uh, to the other half of the continent, that remains a remarkable success story. And indeed, um, uh, uh, ask the people in the Balkans why they want to join the European Union. Well, they say, <laughs> we want uh, uh, to do just what you know, the Czechs, the uh, Slovenes, the Poles and others have done in the past, uh, in the recent past. Um, you want to um, uh, see uh, what the Ukrainians think about why Europe is attractive to them. Well, it has to do with the success of the Eastern enlargement policy. In the documents I have sent you, uh, there are tables giving you GDP per capita uh, over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Well, if you look at those data, basically you have a spectacular, spectacular convergence between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, unprecedented. If you, you look at Poland uh, 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 in the mid 90s, you know, it was maybe 30%, one third of European uh, uh, average GDP. Today, it is over two thirds of that. So this rattrapage, you look at the figures, it's just something unprecedented in history. I, I, I know a thing or two about East European history. There have been various attempts to modernize uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Well, uh, I can tell you this is like the most successful uh, of modernization attempts for Eastern Europe. Uh, you had the modernization in the days of the empires, worked for some, to some extent, for some cities. Bohemia, for instance, the, uh, 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 within the Austrian Empire, but uh, uh, not for most Eastern Europe. You look at um, uh, you look at communism after World War II. It did present itself, uh, believe it or not, as a big modernizing project for these backward rural societies of Eastern Europe. Well, we know what happened to that. Uh, uh, it uh, crashed, actually, uh, 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 not only, but to a large extent, because of its economic failure. And now you could see the European project, the integration into the European Union, as the third modernization. This is the third big attempt at modernizing Eastern Europe, and the most successful. As I said, the catching up is the most rapid that uh, 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 you have seen in history. And so that success story <laughs> is, of course, on the mind of people in Belgrade or in Kiev. You have in the documents I've sent you, you have the comparison with uh, Ukraine and Poland. Why is it interesting? Well, not just because they have similar size, uh, uh, even if the population of Ukraine is bigger than that of Poland, but you have uh, uh, countries which in 1989 were more or less on the same level. The GDP per capita was about the same. So you, you, you have a good comparison point. They had a similar communist system and they had a similar GDP per capita level. And if you look at the situation um, uh, 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 today, and you uh, realize that Poland's GDP is three times that 
of Ukraine, the GDP per capita. So you don't need lengthy speeches about, you know, <laughs> the merits of the European Union because one clearly understands that having done the reform process and the integration into the EU, the investments that it has brought to uh, countries like Poland, that this has been the key to its remarkable uh, 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 progress and to its uh, 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 economic success. And on the contrary, the failure to reform, the persistence of a kleptocratic oligarchic system in the Ukraine, uh, the sort of half-baked pseudo-reforms that they did, well, all this has, uh, to some extent, explains their lagging behind. And uh, so, okay, this was, this is a success story of the enlargement of the European Union and the reason it has uh, been made attractive to the countries on the periphery of the European Union, uh, on the countries outside. And this is where the European neighborhood policy comes in. So you had neighborhood policy designed at the very same time when the accession uh, treaty to the, uh, uh, for the East Europeans uh, was signed in Athens in 2003. Uh, that neighborhood policy, this was in the commission chaired by Romano Prodi, had two main purposes, according to uh, Prodi. Uh, first, uh, avoid creating a barrier, kind, kind of uh, iron curtain between new member states and non-member states, okay? Avoid a barrier. But at the same time, the goal was avoid making uh, the enlargement of the EU the only mode of relationship between the EU and its neighborhood. The enlargement could not be like the only thing that is on offer. You have to offer an alternative to countries, therefore, whose goal would not be to enter the European Union, but to have a close relationship with the EU. That was a point of the neighborhood policy. Romano Prodi had two formulas to describe it. I think this is like in a nutshell what you need to know about that policy. Uh, first, we want to create a circle of friends, a circle of friends around the European Union. Uh, in other words, extend stability, peace, security on our neighborhood, circle of friends. And secondly, what do you offer to those new friends? You offer them everything but institutions, everything but institutions. So you have access to all sorts of European programs. You can get engaged into European uh, money, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, support for various things, everything but institution. In other words, not a place at the table where the European norms are being uh, uh, elaborated and decided. So this was the snack, circle of friends, and then everything but institutions. That was, in a nutshell, the uh, policy. And uh, it was, first of all, a very broad policy meant for all neighbors, and that came under criticism. And it came under criticism mainly from East European uh, members of the European Union, such as Poland in particular, saying, we cannot have one policy for East and South. You know, we cannot have one policy if you have the map of the EU uh, and its neighbors. Well, uh, you can see the diversity of these neighbors. You have, you, you have countries like Jordan, and uh, and uh, Ukraine, and you have you have countries like uh, I don't know Morocco uh, and uh, Moldova. Well, uh, the argument was uh, these countries are too diverse, and you cannot have one policy. You cannot have one size fit all policy uh, by the European Union. So you should really 
go for something uh, different. You have to differentiate. Differentiation was the motto. Now, differentiation indeed took place. Uh, there was a Polish-Swedish initiative, Rex Sikorski, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Carl Bill, the Swedish Foreign Minister, launched in 2008, I think June 2000, uh, uh, May 2008, they a joint initiative suggesting that a separate Eastern policy should be followed. So uh, that's, um, uh, uh, that was um, the first step towards differentiation. Uh, L'Union pour la Méditerranée launched uh, by the French president during the summer 2008. And uh, later, uh, in the following spring, under the Czech presidency, uh, uh, launched in Prague the Eastern Partnership. So you had basically differentiation east and south of the neighborhood policy. Uh, both run into problems. Uh, I cannot deal in detail with them. I will uh, uh, simply mention them. Uh, the problem with the Union pour la Méditerranée was not that it was uh, uh, an initiative, uh, uh, a new initiative, uh, but uh, because sometimes when policies don't work, there is no harm trying something else. And if you want to see why the previous policy towards the southern Mediterranean had not worked, well, you look at the speeches made at the Barcelona summit for the 10th anniversary of the launching of the Barcelona process. Uh, and that was in 95, uh, uh, the Barcelona process launched. So therefore, the 10th anniversary was in 2005. You read those speeches and you see that the main objectives have not been successfully uh, 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 attained. Uh, uh, um, more security? No, not really. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is still there. And, and uh, terrorism and things like that. Second, bridging the gulf economically between the two sides of the Mediterranean. Have we succeeded? Not really. No progress, no significant progress was made there. And then, did we make progress on human rights and democratization? Well, <laughs> not really. Uh, so, uh, if something does not work, there is no harm trying something else. And this is what uh, uh, Sarkozy tried. But the problem with his initiative was not who was uh, 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 present, uh, but also who was not present. So who was present? That was the first problem. And you had all the uh, representatives of the authoritarian regimes of uh, uh, the Arab world. They were there, you know, uh, Mubarak and, and uh, um, uh, well, the, the, the Algerian, the, uh, well, uh, Ben Ali. I mean, you know, all of them, they were there. So basically, that was the first problem. Your partner, if you want to develop policies with southern neighbors, your partners are these authoritarian regimes. So how much progress will you make? on democratization is, of course, uh, a, a big question. The second problem was who was not there and who was not there was the European Union as such. You know, this was the initiative made on behalf of the states that have access to the Mediterranean. So these were the southern European states together with the countries of on the other side of the Mediterranean. But where was the European Union? And this was the main criticism. You cannot launch a policy like that without the European Union's, particularly the Germans were uh, hostile to it. So that was basically a wrong start for the Union for the Mediterranean. Uh, needless to add, uh, uh, we paid dearly for this ill-fated launch. Uh, Later on, more recently, when the Arab Spring came in, in 2011, because we suddenly found ourselves 
basically stuck without the adequate policy tools that a more engaged union for a Mediterranean, a more adapted uh, union for Mediterranean could have been. That's, that's a question mark. Meanwhile, we had differentiation in the East, as I said, and you had this uh, uh, Eastern Partnership launched. But there again, you know, we thought this was differentiation East and South. And what do we discover? So, uh, all right, so we got, we got uh, 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 you know, differentiation East and South, but we have also differentiation in the uh, East itself. Uh, 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 and basically, uh, uh, we have there the uh, uh, challenges of the domain. I think the most important uh, was the Ukrainian and the, uh, 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 to some extent, the Georgian or Moldovan countries that were like the most eager to take part in something like that. Now, what was on offer? Because that is often the question asked. What is it in that neighborhood policy that triggered the crisis uh, over Ukraine, the crisis with Russia over Ukraine? Um, and when you look at the policy, at, at the association agreement, um, you know, it had essentially um, three main uh, three main um, items, three main issues. One of them uh, is opening our markets. This is what we're good at. This is what the EU is great at. You know, it's the it's the biggest market. You know, half a billion people. It's the largest trading block on earth. So, what you offer is access to that market in exchange for. Uh, adopting norms compatible with the EU and making reforms in governance of your economy, of the market, and hopefully of democratic institutions. So this is the idea that governance can be transformed on the periphery through the inclusion into the European market or through the opening of the European market. That is item number one. Item number two was greater mobility. You offer in the neighborhood policy, and that was supposed to be actually for East and South, greater mobility, that is visa liberalization, the idea that people could more easily have access to the countries of the European Union. And uh, thirdly, you had financial support uh, for uh, the reforms that the countries concerned were undertaking. So you have substantial financial support for, uh, uh, for that. Um, uh, uh, during the uh, Arab Spring, there was an attempt to formulate this policy in an even more concise way, and that was the famous three M's. So, uh, uh, that's the three M's. That's more or less what the neighborhood policy uh, was about. And that was shared in the neighborhood policy for the East and South. There were differences, but this was shared. Now, you can imagine uh, uh, what uh, these three items, this kind of policy, um, uh, I mean, who could have imagined that this could be enough to trigger a uh, revolution in the Ukraine? You know, you would think on paper that this looks like a relatively modest uh, proposal. Um, but um, uh, uh, that was not seen like that uh, by uh, Russia in particular. And uh, uh, because they thought uh, it's not the individual particularity of the proposal that worried them. It's basically the whole rapprochement of Ukraine uh, and potentially others uh, with the EU and drifting away from
from Russia's orbit because Russia had its own alternative uh, 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 program, uh, alternative plan, and that's called the Eurasian Economic Union. So uh, there it was seen by Russia as a kind of uh, uh, rivalry, geopolitical rivalry in its neighborhoods, uh, while the EU thought it had a relatively modest uh, proposal for uh, dealing with uh, EU's uh, eastern neighborhood. So there was a kind of misreading on both parts. The EU thought the proposal remained modest and not threatening to Russia. Russia thought it's not the proposal in itself that is the problem. The whole concept that you detach countries from Russia's neighborhood in order to uh, um, organize kind of uh, rapprochement with the uh, uh, European sphere. And uh, so you have there the substance of what the policy was supposed to do, but you have uh, the question of uh, uh, the geopolitical stakes. And uh, uh, that what triggered uh, uh, Russia's opposition to the deal. And that, in turn, when Yanukovych uh, 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 refused to sign uh, the Vilnius uh, agreement, uh, the association agreement um, uh, in November 2014, that's what triggered the so-called Euromaidan uh, revolution. So there we have, um, uh, let's say, a project of, based on European soft power, as I said, that is now suddenly confronted with uh, um, something completely different, uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, um, thinking in terms of spheres of influence and, and uh, geopolitics. So I will, uh, 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 you have there how you have a concept of a policy, but it seems ill-adjusted, uh, uh, inadapted to uh, the situation. Why was it so? Why was uh, uh, suddenly uh, the whole concept of the EU neighborhood policy uh, out of sync with the realities? I think to put it in a nutshell, you could say uh, uh, the EU has changed, the world has changed, uh, the neighborhood has changed. So you have three, three things. Uh, the EU has changed. I don't have to dwell on it very long. Let's say, in a nutshell, with the crisis of the euro, um, uh, the new dividing line in the EU uh, has become north-south, and suddenly you have the, the very core of the European Union, because the Eurozone is the core of the European uh, project, uh, is being questioned. And uh, I don't have to bring you through the whole uh, uh, crisis since 2008, essentially focused on Greece, but it was not only a Greek crisis. And as you know, last summer, at the beginning of last summer, last July, we were on the verge of so-called Grexit, you know, the possibility that Greek would, Greece would exit the European Union. So, um, uh, not the European Union, sorry, uh, that it would exit the uh, Eurozone. Uh, and it was really France which single-handedly kept Greece into, uh, into the European Union. I'm not now discussing whether that was a good decision or not. I'm just stressing the crisis which was touching the very core of the European uh, uh, project. Um, so there you have the European, uh, uh, the European uh, uh, Union uh, the, uh, uh, in, in, in deep crisis. Uh, there 
you have the uh, European Union also divided on how to deal with the neighborhoods, and I will return to it, and that's a division between those who thought the priorities <coughs> should be challenging uh, uh, and facing the challenge in the east, and those who thought the main challenge was coming in the south. And uh, uh, that is those who thought that the main problem was Russia, Putin, the annexation of Crimea, etc. That that was the main threat to uh, Europe, countries like the Baltic countries, Poland, etc. What I was trying to say is that uh, not only the EU has changed, uh, uh, the world has changed, and our neighborhood has changed. So I. I'm not going back to what changed in the EU, its internal crisis and division, north-south, east-west, and Greece being, of course, the symbolic moment of that internal crisis. <coughs> then you have the world has changed, and uh, that includes the main actors uh, that affect our neighborhood. It affects the United States, which has, uh, under Obama, has made number one priority. Uh, in international crises such as the Middle East, it has been uh, uh, having a policy so-called leading from behind, and uh, more or less <coughs> the. Um, Americans have been more in a re responsive, ad hoc uh, mode rather than uh, uh, actually exercising uh, leadership on the international scene. So this can be explained, of course, it's a contrast to the previous policy under uh, George W. Bush, but that, ex that is partially what has happened. This is a different America from the one we had 10 years ago, let's say, on the international scene. And one could add that the international order itself has been transformed. You know, we were in the Cold War with a bipolar system. Then we moved in the 1990s after 1989 and the, the end of the communist world and the Cold War to what Charles Krauthammer had called the unipolar moment, the moment when the United States were the dominant international power with a military capacity equivalent to all of the other powers put together. And then we have moved uh, over the last 10, basically since 9-11 maybe, <coughs> towards a world which is more multipolar, uh, which does not mean multilateral, multipolar which means the emergence of BRICS, uh, that was uh, basically a challenge to the idea that a Western-dominated international order uh, was uh, 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 in place. And what we see now, uh, really, is neither bipolar nor multipolar nor unipolar, no, what we have now is a world which is apolar, has no poles. <laughs> we are in a kind of, uh, uh, well, not quite a state of anarchy, but almost. Uh, there is no structure any longer uh, that can, uh, so to speak, stabilize uh, our neighborhoods.